All right, everyone, welcome to another episode of the Twimmel AI podcast. I am your host, Sam Charrington, and today I'm joined by Cedric Coco, Chief Engineer of the Wayfinder Group at A Cubed. Cedric, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. I'm looking forward to digging into our conversation. We'll be talking about a lot of cool things that you are doing with data centric AI, in particular, your journey with data labeling for your specific use case. To get us started, I'd love to have you share a little bit about your background and how you came to work in ML and AI. Yes, thank you. Um, my name is Cedric Coco. I'm the chief engineer of the Wayfinder Group at A Cube, and that is Airbus Innovation Center in Silicon Valley. Um, my background, I have a PhD in computer vision navigation, and I used to come from the space sector. So I spent part of my life trying to land spacecraft autonomously using one camera on near-Earth asteroids. And uh, I lowered my um, altitude of interest in 2016 when I joined uh, Airbus, and we started to work on aviation rather than spacecraft. Um, and the thing that really attracted me there was the UAM concept, the urban air mobility uh, or air taxis. And at the time, there was this new project that started called Vahana. It was a technology demonstrator, uh, basically a first prototype of one of those air taxis. The whole goal is to provide a completely new way of commuting people within urban areas and suburban areas. And, uh, and this time at scale in the sense of really having thousands of vehicles in a city trying to have passenger going from one area to another to solve the congestion problem that we have in all big urban centers. Um, I was part of the Sense and Avoid crew uh, back in the days, and the central focus was basically developing machine learning and vision for the Sense Avoid system for urban air mobility. And then as we moved uh, forward, um, we realized that this technology was really applicable to a larger range of application for aviation and Airbus. And we started to apply the same technology to commercial aircraft. And this is where we are now. The focus of Wayfinder is to build more autonomy into commercial aircraft. So you mentioned you got started in this uh, air taxi project, uh, Vahana. What were the key uh, technology innovations uh, that drove that project that ultimately led to what you're working on now? Yeah, so air taxis is a completely new breed of aircraft. Um, we're looking at an electro electric uh, propulsion system. We're looking at um, a, basically a vertical takeoff and landing system that can be converted into a fixed wing during uh, the cruise phase for efficiency purposes. But the other aspect that is uh, driving this, this innovation and this revolution in the aviation sector is how you build them. Uh, currently, commercial aircraft are built in the, in the hundreds every year. Um, you, you could hit the thousand, but we're not at the 10,000 or even more uh, in terms of scale. So one of the key concepts that most uh, urban air mobility companies in the area um, and across the world are thinking about is how to combine forces with the automotive industry and with their skills and their production capabilities to be able to scale up production while having the safety standard and the reliability standard of aviation. So this is a huge challenge. And on the, technological, on the technology side, there's two aspects that are really important. One of them is uh, the electric propulsion system, which is quite, in, uh, quite new. Um, and the other one is autonomy. So one of the key and fundamental of uh, air taxis to make it viable is to have a fully autonomous solution down the road. Uh, many are taking roads where they go through an intermediate step where it's going to be piloted. But the end goal is clear for everybody. We need to go for a fully autonomous system. And so that has um, multiple objectives. One of them is... How do you handle traffic at scale over a city with all those aircraft? The other one is um, when that system fails to ensure the proper distances between all the vehicle, what do you have on board to detect that such uh, distances have been sort of violated and how do you uh, respond adequately so that you don't create more risks to other vehicles? So you have this layered approach between air traffic control between deconfliction, reserving the airspace, and then ultimately your sense and avoid on the aircraft itself. And then you have to have the ability to perceive your environment 
on the aircraft to understand what it is and to make the proper decisions that minimize risks and ensure that the passenger is delivered safely to its destination. So my role and the role that the team I was in at the time was really to develop that sense and avoid system, that last piece of this onion model for ensuring the safety of passengers. Mm -hmm. And um, I imagine that translating that into the commercial commercial side of things, there are you know some uh, you know foundational elements that translate, but it, it's a sounds like a very different problem. It is a very different problem because commercial aircraft operates in a completely different airspace, and that airspace is highly controlled. Um, so from the time that you take off from an airport where the tower helps you and guides you, you have already corridors that are reserved for you. Um, so this is a very interesting problem because bringing autonomy to commercial aircraft, when you really look at it, is probably not as hard as autonomous or self-driving cars. Our environment is a lot more structured. We have autopilots that can fly the aircraft when you're in the air during the cruise phase, and we had them for decades now. Um, and they are up to the safety level and the reliability level that you need to be able to transport 300, 350 passengers. Um, the other aspect is our pilots are actually skilled, trained professionals, uh, not to criticize anybody driving uh, in the area, but depending on our expertise, our level of being you know, tired or not, um, let's say drivers are, are more at risk for this. So we have those very skilled uh, pilots. We have this aircraft that already has a good level of autonomy built in. But now what we need to tackle is when you increase the scale of this air traffic, you decrease the distances and especially in terminal areas, how many aircraft can you actually land at an airport and how many can take off within this small volume without creating risks for anyone? And there is certain volume that um, manual operation can control and can tackle. But if you want to go beyond that, then autonomy is a must go um, to be able to maintain the same level of safety while increasing volume, while increasing air traffic. And this is where we come into play because we are looking at a range of autonomous functions to be able to take that leap toward this next generation aircraft and this, this future where basically the air traffic would increase significantly. And just to give you some, some numbers, Based on the trends that we've seen um, before COVID, uh, the air traffic doubled every 15 years. And right in 2019, uh, commercial aircraft carried 4.9 billion passengers. So the application that we're working on um, is technically going to touch about 60% of the planet if you look at the numbers in 2019. And then if you look at doubling that, uh, meaning that roughly you would touch nine to 10 billion people a year. Um, you, the, the need in terms of safety, the needs in terms of making sure that this fully automated system works well is uh, orders of magnitude beyond most of the other application that we see there. And when you talk about increasing the, the volume and the requirements that that places, especially around the, the terminal, uh, the terminals in the terminal area, I'm thinking that one of the major factors we're talking about is like uh, the spacing in approaches and landings and things like that. And there are parameters around where you want that to be if uh, it's being done manually. And the idea is that if it's fully autonomous, that you can kind of shrink that spacing. Is that the idea? So. There's two things that we're really trying to achieve. One of them is that there is a lot of things that the pilot must do when he approaches the terminal of the airport and when he navigates either, so either when he's doing, um, he's landing the aircraft, he's in the taxi phase or he's taking off. And what we want to build is enough autonomy in those aircraft so that the pilot stops being worried about all those small details plus the strategic aspects and can really focus only on the strategic part. For that, there's a range of functions that needs to be built in. So for example, autonomous landing, so that the person can focus on other aspects than just controlling the aircraft toward the right glide slope to be able to touch the runway at the right point. All of that can be abstracted out. 
the aircraft can take care of it and the pilot can focus his attention on more strategic aspects um, of the flight. Um, one of them is, for example, what is the route that he will need to take um, to confirm that this is the right runway that he needs to, to, to land at, for instance. And during the taxi phase, especially, um, there's, it's pretty crowded um, in the, on the runway, and especially when you're getting close to the gates. So being able to have a system that keeps an eye on all that traffic around you and alerts you when re really your attention is needed for one particular aspect is really going to help lower the workload of the pilots and help the, the overall operation to be more efficient and safer as well. I'm going to say this is where ML becomes a critical component of the system because doing all of that autonomous detection of the runway, uh, autonomous assessment of where your aircraft is during that landing uh, segment and during the taxi phase, making sure that the aircraft is really where it's supposed to be on the runway, that it, there's no object around. So, you know, the collision uh, protection function is key. So all of those requires a heavy dose of perception and decision making. And the range of things that you see in the complexity of the situation makes it hard for classical approaches to work and really requires the power of ML to be able to ensure the performance and the reliability that we expect out of that function. Yeah, let's dig into that a little bit more deeply. You reference um, autonomous vehicles earlier as kind of a, you know, a comparison uh, in the urban taxi context. Uh, there's obviously a lot of investment happening uh, in that type of autonomy right now from a, a ML and AI perspective. Um, but again, this sounds like a, a very different problem. Can you kind of elaborate on some of the ways that from a technical perspective, the problem that you're dealing with uh, differs from what someone who's working on uh, AV um, uh, cars is, is work thinking about? Yeah, that's a, it's a very interesting question because one of the strategies here is to leverage a lot of the work that has been done in the self-driving car industry. Um, they've been starting this uh, decades ago. Um, and so there's a lot of legacy, a lot of system that is available. And so for us to be able to speed up our developments, being able to leverage all of that work um, is to our benefit. However, there's a certain limit at which we can transfer and readapt that technology without tuning it and actually, or changing it from the bottom up. So for instance, um, cars needs to see in 2D plus height, but it's a 2.5D problem. Uh, they need to see, you know, 200, 300 meters in front of them. And maybe the autonomous trucks needs to see a little further. But in our case, when the aircraft gets close to an airport, we need to see kilometers ahead of time. And uh, the object that we're trying to see are actually very small in the image. And we need very high resolution image to be able to have just enough pixel, enough information to give to the ML or other algorithms to be able to make heads and tails of everything that they see in there. So typically, we the cameras that we need to use to be able to do those functions um, are in the order of 10 to 15 megapixels versus in the car industry in the order of two, maybe five megapixel for very high resolution. And then in our case, because we operate in 3D, we need more, of course, than one camera. We need a camera. We need cameras to cover the full space uh, ahead of us. So that is one um, differentiator between our use case and the self-driving car use case is just the sheer number of pixels that we need to deal with um, in real time. The other aspect um, is real time performance. We need to guarantee. Um, that our algorithm perform adequately at the frame rate that we have. So basically, we need to guarantee real-time performances. And for that, the level of guarantee that we need to provide um, depends on what we call the design assurance level, which is basically a gauge on the safety and the process that we've put behind to guarantee the safety of those systems. And um, the, autonomy, the aviation industry actually has very stringent standards on that. And what happens is before we can even use um, an aircraft, the certification authorities need to stamp our system. So they need to look at all the details. Because of all the guarantees that we need to give to certification authorities, um, and because of the fact that they need to stamp our design and they need to stamp um, 
the way we are writing the software before we can even start using the aircraft, um, there's a lot more that we need to put into those developments and a lot more proof on the safety and the performance of those algorithms that we need to provide than any other application. I was just going to, to jump in there. I remember, you know, hearing, uh, you know, presentations around the kind of verification and validation that happens, you know, for example, by, you know, NASA software engineers building those kinds of systems and uh, classical aeronautic systems. And that seems, I guess, like a, a, a culture clash, you know, when you're thinking about machine learning and probabilistic types of systems. And, and I'm wondering how, um, you know, how you bring those two worlds together in uh, areas like this. That is a fundamental challenge for us. So um, our team is at the crossroad between two very different worlds. Our team is drawing people from uh, software companies such as Google, Facebook, uh, the cell driving car in, uh, companies in the area. They're used to create software in a certain way, a very you know rapid way. And exactly, exactly. And That doesn't and work when you're carrying 300 people. This is exactly the problem is um, destructive flight test is not really an option for us. Um, and then on the aerospace side, what the people that you have there are used to do things right the first time and to have everything deterministic, everything planned and everything verified. And so what we're doing right now is we are proposing those new algorithms based on machine learning that are completely probabilistic based. And we're saying, it's going to work. We can predict that it will work to a certain um, a certain performance standard, um, but we don't have any formal proof for you. We can only do that statistically. What does that even mean? Are you are you referring to um, kind of the application of formal methods to provide kind of performance envelopes and guarantees to your system? Exactly. So right now, there's a lot of work that is being done in formal methods. And those mes methods have proven to be very useful for, let's say, um, algorithms of uh, low to medium complexity. But when we're tackling autonomous landing, autonomous taxi function, for example, the sheer number of pixels and the image size that we need to deal with and the speed at which we need to deal with them uh, makes those application, for now, uh, barely usable. Um, we, we basically don't have the right tool to be able to apply it on very complex neural network that would be based on, um, architectures like ResNet or VGG or, um, all the newest flavor as well. The, so at that point, since we can't rely on those formal methods, um, what we're left with is those statistical methods. And one of the things that makes it really hard is that we don't know the distribution of the events beforehand. So we need to be able to do those data collection to be able to understand what is our environment as far as our function are concerned. What is the, um, let's call it for a Gaussian distribution, you know, what is the nominal case that gives you, you know, your, your 60%, but also what is the long tail events? Um, and one of the interesting use, uh, the interesting example that we have is we've captured on video an elephant walking on taxiways in Africa, just behind some commercial aircraft at an airport. And there's no way any of our engineers, at least in Silicon Valley, could have figured this one out. Um, but these are cases that our system for object detection, for example, will have to tackle. So this is the, the challenge is that we can't use those formal approaches because we don't know what the world is made of until you've done that data collection and that could data co Sorry, and that data collection really gives you just a statistical, uh, the means to do a, t a statistical approach. And in terms of that statistical pro statistical approach, what are some of the the tools that you're using? Early on, when we started to um, do flight tests, and uh, one of the greatest achievements that we've done in our team is actually work on the AI that completed the very first um, autonomous landing of an A350 with a camera system. And, uh, and to give you an idea that the A350 is this aircraft that carries between 300 and 350 air, uh, 50 passengers. Um, so it's a fairly big beast to land. Now, when we did that, one of the first thing that we noticed is uh, flying an A350 is quite costly. It's time consuming and to ensure safety, 
it takes um, quite a bit of time to go through all the hoops to have the authorization to fly it. So doing data collection using flight test aircraft is a lengthy and, and time consuming process. So what we have developed here in Silicon Valley is this hybrid approach where we said, well, the software engineers here are used to those two weeks development cycle or those very short development cycle where there's a new release every couple of weeks. And how can we do that for aerospace? So what we did is we acquired our own aircraft that we own and operate. And we've modified that aircraft to be equipped with all the sensors that we need to perform those functions. And we are now flying this aircraft throughout the area to be able to do data collection in those different conditions that we're going to see in the field. So it can range from clear conditions during daytime to uh, night conditions, but also what we call degraded conditions. So fog, low ceiling, rain, um, and all those. And to be able to have real data and to be able to acquire the volume necessary to start doing those statistical proofs of reliability and performance is essential for us to push the maturity of those functions. Are you saying, or is it the case that you have to fly, if you want to do this on A350s, you have to fly A350s for data collection, or are you flying uh, you know, cheaper vehicles for data collection? And in our case, when we started in the flight test aircraft, we started doing data collection on A350s um, and other big commercial aircraft. Um, but uh, it's quite costly to do so. And after analyzing the problem, we saw that we don't actually need to use such an aircraft to collect data that is applicable and usable to develop those functions. And the reason is, um, in our case, we're using a Beechcraft Baron to collect the data for uh, visual landing si for the visual landing system. And uh, the Baron, although less stable than an A350, can replicate the approach that an A350 would do. Um, can ex explore the full service volume that we need to explore and can cover pretty much all of the conditions that an A350 would encounter. And even to a certain extent, um, because the Beechcraft Baron is less stable than an A350, we cover a wider range of conditions than what we would be able to do with an A350. So on that respect, it's actually a way of building a more robust system using a cheaper aircraft that is available for us anytime. Yeah, yeah. Uh, going back to the, the previous question about statistical tools, um, I'm trying to get a little bit more clarity on what that looks like. Like I'm, I, I'm envisioning you're using something akin to like, you know, confidence testing or something like that, but it's not clear to me how you ever have confidence if you don't know what your your plane is going to be able to see. So I'm looking for kind of names of, oh, we use this statistical method or this or that to to produce these these guarantees. Is that is that something that you can elaborate on? Yes. Um, so first thing is we need to identify what are the dimensions of the problem um, that affects the performance of, in this case, the ML model or the perception stack. Um, so one of the things that we've observed is the configuration of the airport is critical. If you have only one runway, it's easier to identify than when you're in Chicago where you have like seven with runways that are crossing each other and taxiways that are confusing everything. So the airport configuration is, for example, one of those dimensions. The other one is um, lighting conditions, um, weather conditions. So, and you have also those, uh, I'm gonna call it corner cases. So when you have the sun in view or when you have the moon in view and you're trying to perform this function, that will affect the performance of the ML if it has never seen such uh, occurrences. Now, once we have identified those dimensions, we need to understand um, what is the amount of data that we need to be able to be representative of our environment for each of those dimensions. And then what we can do is using a representative um, statistical set, so a number of population of images that represent our, our space, um, we can take the ML, do the test over a percentage of that with a holdout at the end, and then by having multiple folds and basically reshuffling this, we can understand what is the degree of generalization 
of the ML model. And using that statistic, we can derive from there how many airports do we need to see to guarantee to a certain probability that we will meet our performance. So to, to give you an example, um, let's say that we've collected data on 100 different airports. We can use that 100 airports and say, let's try to train only on 30 and check how we perform on the rest. And then we do that again, saying we take 40, 50, et cetera. From there, you can draw a curve. And at some point, that curve will hit an asymptote that tells you, I've reached my target performance. And any additional airport on top of that will increase or improve it. But you've, you're already there. So from there, we can backtrack how many airports or how many samples we need in each of those dimensions. And so that's, that's one of the approach um, that we're exploring to be able to provide this statistical proof. Thus far in the conversation, you've kind of connected the safety critical nature of what you're doing and the need to provide these performance guarantees to kind of this very fundamental task that you know all ML practitioners are worried about data collection. Um, and you've talked a little bit about how you collect the data, you know, there's also the aspect of labeling the data, which has been, uh, you know, which is a big deal as well. Can you talk a little bit about some of the challenges of labeling for your use case? Absolutely. Um, and I think anybody that has worked in ML fully understand that getting the right data and getting the good labels is half of the work. Um, and the other half being able to train it and test it properly. So Labeling and acquiring that data is one of the major challenges for our industry. Um, the car industry has the luxury of being able to collect data in a fairly cheap way because they need to equip a car. That's certainly an expensive piece of equipment, but after that, driving around is not an expensive operation. In our case, flying is an expensive operation, meaning that getting data is, is time consuming. It's, we need to put a lot of resources behind it. And then after that, we need to label that data and we need to label to a level of precision that has rarely been seen in other use cases. Um, and I'm gonna give you an example of uh, the typical classifier and bounding box uh, sort of ML model that you have out there. So for detecting cats and dogs. So most of the time to be able to do those typical classification problem and to put a bounding box on it uh, using, for example, the typical YOLO um, architecture, do you, your labeling needs is basically you need to fit an, a box um, on an image that mainly contains the object of interest. So, for example, your dog may be half of the image or maybe 40% of all your pixels. And so that means at the end, if you put a bounding box on it, um, as a manual operator would, even if the bounding box is not well fitted over the object and you're taking another 70 pixels on the side of your, your image for, for example, an HD image, that's still more or less you know, within the 2% or 5% margin. And your ML model uh, will be able to generalize over all of those samples, assuming that you don't have an inherent bias into your, your images. So the, the classical approach makes it, um, if, you, if you forgive the term, makes sloppy labels still OK to achieve the right performance. Now, in our case, if you take a 12 megapixel image, which is the, the typical range of uh, resolution that we need for landing an aircraft and being able to provide the, the navigational parameter for it, the airport can be as small as 20 pixel by 20 pixel in this image. So at the end, um, if you want to keep your error bounded, your bounding box on that object needs to be within maybe 5 pixel uh, or 3 pixels. So what does it mean in terms of labeling is that the manual labeler needs to take that 12 megapixel or even 15 megapixel image, needs to zoom in as soon as he has identified where the object and that tiny object is in the image, and then needs to work um, on putting this bounding box as tight as possible around it within a three pixel accuracy. Um, and so that is quite a challenge, as um, anybody that has worked with manual labeling knows. Um, and it's also time consuming. And I'm going to add that most of our crowdsourcing strategies to be able to do that, so meaning gathering a large population of manual annotator, 
is not a good method to do this because the level of accuracy required uh, requires a lot more time than they will spend because of the money that they're getting out of it. I mean, there there are even you know simpler challenges like most of the the folks that we're paying to do manual labeling. I'm imagining a 12 megapixel image is going to take a long time to download and is going to choke their machine. That that is absolutely right. The the whole pipeline behind it of being able to transfer uh, those data to the annotator is a challenge in itself. We could. And one of the strategies, for example, to break it down into a subgrid um, so that, but it gives you more images at the end, more images to uh, annotate, still meaning more time to do so. And the problem is um, at scale, it doesn't work at all. Um, if you're at a point where you're collecting literally millions of images every week, um, it is totally impossible to break down those images into those 500 by 500, for example, pixel images and have this army of human annotators uh, looking at each of them. The throughput is just going to break the whole chain, which forces us at that point to think about auto-labeling approach or semi-automated approach. And I'm going to say this is not a binary um, problem in the sense you can think about it as a spectrum. Um, in the very first stage, when you, your ML models are immature and you're just learning how to do this, you're going to need a human annotator for pretty much every frame. But then as you're starting to build some autonomy on top of it, in the sense uh, you have algorithms, heuristics that can start to make sense of the data and give you a first uh, guess of what you need to annotate, then you can increase um, the number of images that you're automatically annotating and have the human annotator only checking every one image out of 10. And then as those algorithms, again, mature, you can push the cursor further and have the annotator looking at one image over 100, over 1,000, et cetera. And then the ultimate goal for us is when you reach the millions, um, you know, one image out of one million is still something that a human annotator can do. But how do you ensure the quality and the consistency of the million of images behind it? And that is the fundamental challenge for the labeling parts that we are addressing. Mm -hmm. And before we jump into the uh, automatic labeling, automated labeling in more detail, uh, speaking to the previous comment, do, do you, both from a labeling perspective, as well as from a model perspective, do you tile the images or um, do you keep the images whole? So for the labeling, this I'm going to, to use an expression that everybody hates. Um, it depends. <laughs> <laughs> um, so for the images, the, the concept that we've seen is because our use case for commercial aviation is within a very structured environment compared to others. We have a priori knowledge on the environment that we can leverage to actually um, break it down. So in the sense, uh, to, be, to be more practical here, we know exactly where the airport is because we have the lat long uh, coordinates and this isn't a database. Now, where should it be in the image is the question. So as soon as we know the GPS coordinate of the aircraft, we know its attitude. Heading and all that stuff, yeah. Exactly. And then if we have the camera calibrated and we know exactly where it is and where it's pointing at on the aircraft, then we roughly know where the airport is supposed to be within the image. Now, there's still sufficient amount of errors in there so that we can't just rely on that system to guide the aircraft all the way to the runway. Meaning you can't do a full geometric solution because there's a lot of noise and uncertainty in the system. Exactly. This is where the ML component becomes necessary because we need to go from a rough uh, region of interest to the exact position of the runway within the image. But that gives us a first guess. And this is a region of interest that we can cut out from that 12 megapixel um, image and then have the annotators annotate instead of looking at the, the whole image. So that is one technique to reduce the amount of pixels that we need to process when we're labeling things. Mm. So in other words, what you primarily care about for the task that we're discussing, you know, e.g. landing, is the airport and the runways. 
And a lot of your images are going to have, by definition, a lot of sky, for example, and you don't really care about having that annotated so you can kind of crop that out. Exactly. And, you know, one additional thing is, um, as as you're pointing out, like during cruise where you can only see sky, this is something that we're not even recording because there there is no task to be done when you're in cruise. Um, It's all the airspace is controlled. So you know that your separation is guaranteed. Um, So on that case... It's, it's a very safe environment. So you need to start recording as soon as you are in the terminal area and you're in the last stretch to be able to land that aircraft on the airport. And even in there, as you said, there's a large portion that might be the sky at the beginning. As you get closer, the scale of the runway will change and the runway will take the full field of view of your image. And this is also one of the challenges for the ML on the ML side, uh, as a side note is, you start looking at the tiny little box in the middle of your image and the ML has to recognize that as a runway and then do the math behind it to be able to give you exactly your position with respect to it. And then you have to go all the way to the point that you don't even see the full runway, you only see a portion of it. And yet, all the way to the landing, your ML model still needs to take that partial image and compute the exact same thing of where you are with respect to it to be able to land your aircraft. So the scale, the scaling factor is a major challenge, both for the ML part, but also for the annotation, because we need to ensure that um, our error on the labels are tightly controlled over this entire range of scales. And then the other side of my question was with regard to uh, building and training the model, your, your typical um, computer vision networks are, you know, hundreds of pixel wide images uh, is kind of what they're tuned for. Are you tiling or are you using techniques that work at full scale images? Um, So this is a this is a very good question because it taps into the real time performance with respect to the onboard compute power that we have available. Um, And I'm going to the the flip side of that is inference, right? Exactly. Exactly. And, uh, and I'm going to make a little digression here just to understand the, the fundamental problem. So on an aircraft, everything needs to be certified and everything needs to be deterministic, which means that the type of computer that we can use to run the ML algorithms are not the typical GPU that you use on your uh, gaming laptop. Um, they're much less powerful and there's redundancy built into it. And so essentially, it's a big constraint to be able to achieve the real-time performance that we need to have. So having said that, um, processing 12 megapixel or 15 megapixel images in real time when you have three cameras, for example, processing it at the same time is a major challenge for us. So there's different approaches of doing this. Tiling is definitely one of the first methods that um, we are using, but also we the, uh, the other aspect is to exploit the scale. So if we can shrink the image and we can use the image at different scales. It also provides you a, a filter that lets information at different frequencies pop out. So for example, when you're pretty far from the runway, if you shrink the image, it actually blurs out the high frequency item that are actually noise and that you don't really care about. And you can see more clearly the runway down the road. Um, now that's one approach. Um, the other approach is really to take the full image just cut it in uh, in grids that overlapped each other and to basically brute force it over the entire thing. But again, like here, this approach, we're, the bottleneck is the compute power that is available. And uh, and we don't have the luxury of having, you know, a full server of GPUs in the in the trunk um, like we, we would in other applications. And so kind of getting back to the labeling task, do the labels, I guess the labels would translate from you're uh, you're essentially down sampling sampling your images you know the label is it's kind of a one way one one mapping so that's not you don't have to manually label down sampled images separate from the full resolution images no that's right you would sample the images only once at the highest resolution yeah and then you could reuse that as you as you down sample it however i i have to say you can down sample it uh so that Basically, you have this filtering effect that happens, um, and that enables you to go faster in processing the image. 
but it's not sufficient and you can't just use the output of that if, because the resolution and the precision of the output parameter that we need um, is such that we also need the full resolution imagery and to have a pixel level accuracy uh, in the detection now at the end. So I guess what I'm saying is um, you can use those different techniques of, for example, cutting out a region of interest out of your image of downsampling it as well, but it's not sufficient. You need at the end, once you've defined really the region of interest to get back to the original image with the highest resolution possible to get that last piece of precision that you need for your autopilot, for instance. I think what I'm hearing you say is that you use these tricks like the downsampling more to identify kind of regions of interest, and then you pass full resolution images to your models, um, as opposed to you know some funky model that knows how to deal with both full resolution and downsampled images or something like that. So what I'm, we're exploring different ways of doing that, but essentially what I'm saying is um, those are a range of techniques that you can use. And then there's different architectures uh, behind it where you can parallelize some of those uh, from that processing. Um, and that is the way for us to achieve both the precision that we need at the frame rates uh, that we need to process all of that information. So that means that um, and this is the second big challenge for us. Uh, we can't just reuse ML models out of the shelf from the uh, fresh from the press from Google or Facebook um, because they're, they're essentially unfit for our application. So there's definitely some big segments that we can reuse uh, that is very useful for us. But at the end, because of the performance constraints that we have, the compute constraints, the huge images, uh, we need to si significantly rethink the architecture and create sort of novel architectures that really um, matches our needs. We started talking a bit about uh, automated labeling and we, you mentioned the kind of using the geometry to identify where an airport is. Is there more to the automated labeling? Is, is that the automated labeling or is that just, you know, focusing the, the, on what needs to be labeled, and then you're doing more from an automated labeling perspective. The way I'm going to answer the question is it's 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 an evolution of our pipeline. Um, at the very beginning, as I said, everything was ma was labeled manually. Uh, actually, I was going to say in-house um, until we ran out of interns. No, th this is a joke. Um, until basically people so said that it's it's completely unfeasible to scale it up. So after that, this is, well, actually soon after that, we started looking into those heuristics um, and those semi-automated processes to be able to label the images with as few human or manual label as possible. And we are building the stack um, so that we use more of those algorithms, more of those heuristics to be able to increase the precision of our label to be able to increase the consistency of them and to be able to do that at greater scale with fewer human supervision. So the middle portion of that journey is what we call uh, weak supervision, for example, or programmatic means. So we're starting to have some of those heuristics applied um, and it gives us enough consistency and enough accuracy so that we can meet the performance requirements um, that we have. But again, there's a scaling challenge here because, for example, um, along one landing, we might have to pick uh, 20 or 50 images that are manually labeled so that we can recalibrate all of the entire sequence. Um, so, you know, that would be a mix of programmatic aspect or weak supervision with the manual labeler sort of going back at it and sort of giving you some, some pointers to the algorithm so that everything is, is readjusted and all the errors are minimized in your sequence. Can you elaborate on that recalibration? One of the things is there's a lot of vibration, for instance, on an aircraft. And what you need to know uh, to be able to label things properly is what is your camera position on the aircraft and what is its orientation with respect to your frame of reference. And that thing moves over time. So when we're doing data collection, um, our aircraft will do maybe 50 landings during that data collection. 
And the exact position and the exact calibration matrix that we need to apply for that camera will not be the same between the first flight test and the last flight test. The only way to compensate for that is to, in retrospect, analyze the full sequence and do what we call a bundle adjustment over it. So um, recalculate what would be the calibration for that sequence. And then using that optimized calibration matrix, uh, recompute where all the labels should be. And that is one way of minimizing the error over those labels. And this is for the, the programmatic labels. That's correct. So yeah, that yeah, is yeah. our way of using heuristics um, to be able to automatically label those, um, those images. Mm -hmm. But unlike a programmatic labeling task on like NLP, where you've got your heuristics, you apply them to your data and you get some, some uh, labels, you've got this loop where, you know, just that one shot data point isn't sufficient because the you think you know where your camera is, but you don't really until you analyze a sequence of images and then you can, you have to kind of go back and correct. Exactly. And this is why we, we often have the question saying, if you can auto label your images, why don't you use your auto labeling algorithm in inference to actually do the function? And uh, the, the simple answer is, well, that algorithm only, only works once you have the full sequence and you've already landed and you can sort of recalculate all of it and then subtract the error uh, out of your sequence. So essentially it's, it's completely inapplicable to um, the inference case. Um, but one, one additional thing is the heuristics um, have some limitations, uh, especially when you're starting to look at uh, long tail events. Uh, this is where typically they fail. And, uh, and also at larger scales, um, to be able to ensure the consistency and the quality of your labels using those heuristics might prove of a challenge. And this is where the, the journey that I was talking about keeps on going, because at some point, if you have enough data and your ML is mature enough, you can start to use your ML to go back into your data set and start doing auto-labeling. And using the output of your ML um, with the uncertainty with the, uh, or the confidence, depending on the metrics and how you, you factor in those, uh, those output for your ML, you can identify pieces or groups of data that needs further attention for labeling. And so this is the entire journey from your very first image that you hand label to the batch of images that you're programmatically labeling with some su human supervision all the way to the grail where you have your ML automatically annotating your data sets with very specialized ML trained for that, that wouldn't run on your aircraft. And, uh, but, and, and the journey here is that we're trying to get to that point where ML is, is usable in that way while guaranteeing again, like the precision and accuracy that we need for our use case, which is extremely high. Yeah. Is it fair to characterize that last stage as kind of a, a hybrid of programmatic labeling and active learning? Exactly. And the, the active learning is, um, is a very interesting approach, which has been implemented in, in various flavors uh, across the industry, um, especially in industries where you have a vast amount of data or when the data is cheap to acquire and you have more data on your hand than you actually need and you want to sort out which one is useful and which one is not. In our case, we're not in this uh, data-rich environment. Data is hard to get. Uh, data is costly to get. So active learning in our case means something slightly different. Mm. It's is more really, like active labeling in a sense. <laughs> that, that would be a new, a new label that would really fit our purpose. Active labeling, it's true that during one sequence, during one landing, if you're capturing images at, for example, 20 frames per second, um, your you know, frame one will not be very different from frame two. So in that respect, active learning, um, if you follow the, the, the concept, would say, well, subsample your images because what you want is diversity. But you also need to guarantee volume in a certain way. And this one is also kind of a challenge for us to get. So we have to have this balance between labeling enough to get the critical volume, but then ensuring diversity by looking at which data provides the most learning value over it. So our implementation is going to be slightly different from other industries, but it's still very relevant to be able to pick the right data that you want to have in your data set at the end. Part of what I heard when you described the way you apply programmatic labeling is that you're applying these heuristics to these images 
you're kind of going back through a second time or, you know, end time in a, in a loop to, uh, to calibrate or recalibrate. Uh, but it almost sounded like then you have these labels, which you have a, a, a very high degree of confidence about, I guess that's prompting the thought, you know, are you then when you're training, do you consider that, you know, weak supervision in the sense that the labels are noisy or are you still worried about noise? And if so, how do you deal with that? So noise is still going to be in there. Um, and, but to a degree that we have control over. So essentially the whole point is to be able to quantify the error and understand that at the end of labels, are going to have some amount of error, but not beyond a certain threshold that we've specified. Now, this is extremely hard to do um, because when you're meeting new conditions that you haven't encountered in the past, um, you're not sure that your labeling pipeline and your heuristics are going to provide the same level of quality and consistency as known environments, known conditions, um, and images coming from, from this, this operational domain. So to give you a concrete example, um, labeling daytime images for lending uh, is something that we understand how to do and we understand how to provide the sufficient precision and consistency on it. But nighttime is an entirely new ballgame here. So this is an exercise that we've done as well. And what we've seen is that our labeling pipeline for daytime doesn't work. During nighttime, you don't see the same features. Um, and for example, one of the things is uh, trying to put a um, trying to identify the corner points of a runway is not feasible during nighttime because you, you don't actually see it. All you see is the lights around. So as soon each, it's going to be an iterative process. Each time we're pushing further the operational domain that our function needs to operate in, we're going to encounter those new conditions, those new images, and we will have to assess whether the current labeling pipeline can still provide uh, the same quality and uh, basically the, the same bound on the error. And most likely, we're going to have to iterate on this. And uh, so in that way, I guess the point that I'm trying to make here is that it's a full loop. You are using your labeling pipeline to provide labels with a certain error, a certain consistency. But then at the same time, you need to test your labeling pipeline to see what kind of error it induces in your labels based on those conditions. And for that, you need reliable data. So it's kind of a chicken and egg problem. You need well-labeled data to test your labeling pipeline, and you need a good labeling pipeline to provide you right labels um, and right images. So that is the challenge that we're, we're facing. I'm also wondering about the use of or thoughts on the role of synthetic data for your use case. Um, you know, in a sense, I guess the thought is coming from, I would think there are a fairly small number of airports that that can accommodate an Airbus 350. You know, why don't you send someone around, you know, and in fact, there may be survey data that knows where the corner points are once you can localize the airport. Like, can you then just generate synthetically all the training data that you need? That is a very good point. And I'm going to say it ties into two things. Um, one is we can absolutely replicate all the airport across the world because there's database of them. Um, so this is a capability that we have. And the other point is we it's going to be very challenging to be able to collect real data at all the airports in the world that we operate at or that we want to operate at. So this is where it really is helpful because you can collect data on a sub portion of those airport. You can generate the synthetic data for all of them and using those two data sets and verifying that your synthetic data is actually representative of your real data. You can create a very extensive data set to train the neural network but also to test it. And this is the point that I want to make is the, the difficulty and the challenges in improving the safety and the reliability of the algorithm requires a large data set that needs to be shown as representative of your environment and dense enough, and dense enough to be able to give you the statistical proof at the end. And this is extremely hard to do with real data because of the challenge of collecting it. And this is where synthetic data can be very useful because from a sparse um, population of, of samples, 
you can recreate that population with synthetic data, make it a very dense population and make your case based on that population with a mix of real and synthetic data. So this is one of the avenue that um, self-driving cars have taken is, for example, for one mile that you know a typical autonomous car is driving, they're probably generating a thousand mile of uh, simulated driving and they're testing their algorithm on all of that. So that gives you a one to thousand leverage and um, that enables you to have the statistical um, meaningfulness that you need uh, to start to trust your system. And so in our case, we are looking at the same approach of leveraging synthetic data, not only for the training, but also for the testing. Are there other techniques or approaches or ways that you see your pipeline evolving that we haven't touched on? So one of the other alternative to purely synthetic data and real data is uh, data augmentation. And uh, that is a very nice and I'm going to say cheap way of reusing your real data and creating new data that has learning value. So you've got daytime images, make them look like nighttime images and put them through the pipeline. Exactly. And one of the challenges as well that uh, might not necessarily come to mind is uh, you're using one type of camera when you're recording the imagery. It might not be the same that you're using at inference. And actually, as the generation of aircraft goes on and your your you know new cameras comes in, it might be a completely different camera they're going to be using 10 years or 15 years from now. But you still want to be able to use the data that you've collected because of all the energy and the resources that you've put into it. And so being able to reuse that real data, post-processing it so that the noise, for example, looks different and matches your new new camera, um, you can induce chromatic aberration, uh, so change and shifts in RGB. And you can also warp those images so that they look different in terms of perspective. Um, there is some studies to put rain on top of uh, you know, good and clear condition imagery. And then you can put some fog, et cetera. Now, the, the challenge at some point is you can do all those fancy things on top, but you always need to validate that they are representative of the real data. And this is where it you cannot just start with synthetic and stick in synthetic and then deploy it in the real world. This validation is the thing that is somewhat taxing because you need all that real data to prove that you're still in the in the real world. Well, Cedric, lots of exciting stuff there. Sounds like you've got enough to keep you busy for quite a while. <laughs> we are. We are indeed. And uh, I, I must add, this is this is a very exciting time for us because, um, in contrast with the automata and the you know car industry, we're really at the beginning of this, and this is a brand new revolution of autonomy in aviation. And so we are building the sort of the foundation block of how to use ML and how to use artificial intelligence into not only commercial aircraft but a wide range of aviation products. And so. The other, the other mission that for me is really exciting at A-Cube in particular is we're drawing all those um, engineers from other fields such as you know, Google, Facebook, um, the, the self-driving car industry that have a big knowledge and a, a significant amount of experience in those industries. And we're pulling them into the aviation industry and we're saying, okay, so you have those you know, 10 year cycle to produce a new aircraft, but we want to use all those new techniques that Silicon Valley has created to be able to do, let's say, one new release every three weeks. And we're going to be able to push that to an aircraft and test those things. And so just the pipeline and the processes are going to be revolutioning the, uh, the aviation industry. It's, it's basically a brand new world for us. So it's, it's quite exciting to be in this sphere. And I'm, I'm going to say as well, um, just as a, a last note, um, A-Cube and Wayfinder is actively recruiting. <laughs> so if you're interested in facing all those challenges and working with us, it will be a pleasure to uh, have your application. Where should they go? And we'll make sure to include it in the show notes page. Yes. So iCube has its own uh, website. And uh, if you actually type uh, wayfinder.arrow, uh, it will redirect you directly to uh, our page with our blogs and uh, the join the team um, section. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Cedric, thanks so much for joining and sharing a bit about what you're up to. Very cool stuff. Thank you very much for inviting me.